In the most simple description, atoms consist of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And the protons are those particles that are positively charged, the electrons are negatively charged, and the neutrons have no charge. Now, with respect to masses, the mass of a proton is considered to be approximately the same as the mass of a neutron. However, the mass of an electron is very small when compared to the masses of the neutrons and the protons. So, this mass here is so small that it's considered to be negligible. Now, the protons and the neutrons are located in the nuclei of an atom. And this is the place where we will focus our attention now when we talk about elements, nuclides and isotopes. A nuclide is an isotope-specific atom. Let's name it nu. This nuclide here is defined by its number of protons, z, which defines the element we're talking about, and its number of neutrons, which defines the isotope of that element we're talking about. And this is because for any nuclide, the sum of protons and neutrons gives the atomic weight, a. And all of this is expressed by this notation here. So in our example here, we have oxygen. And oxygen has eight protons, and therefore it has an atomic number of eight. But the number of neutrons oxygen has may vary. In this case here, and for most of the cases, oxygen has eight neutrons which turns it into a nuclide with 16 atomic mass units. Most oxygen nuclides are like this. So they have 16 atomic units. And to be more precise, 99.7 9.5% of all oxygen in the world is like this. However, 0.204% of the remaining oxygen has 10 neutrons instead. So this guy here has 10 neutrons, giving it a mass of 18 atomic units. And we still have the remaining 0.037%, which has 9 neutrons. So this guy has 9 neutrons, giving it a mass of 17 atomic units. So these three here are all stable isotopes of oxygen, but we say that the most common one, which is this one, the one with a, a mass of 16 is the most abundant. So this one is the most abundant. Whereas the ones with masses of 17 and 18 are the rare isotopes. So these two are the rare isotopes with a, an, a very low abundance, right? Um, and because these here are the ones with more atomic units, we say that they are the heavy, the, that they are the heavy isotopes. This one is also a heavy isotope, whereas this one is the light isotope. And also, we need to notice here that the heavy isotopes tend to be the rare stable isotopes. So this two. Whereas the lighter tends to be the most abundant one. Now, why are these three here stable isotopes? Well, the thing is, the number of neutrons in the nucleus of an atom may vary. However, 
this variation here from the number of protons it has is very limited. So if a nucleus like this one contains too much or too few neutrons, it becomes unstable. Unstable isotopes are called radioactive nuclides. So these are radioactive nuclides and they have a certain probability of nuclear decay. Meaning that their nucleus is going to break apart just because it is so unstable. The three main ways this happens is by the emission of alpha particles, beta particles and gamma radiation. We will not get much into that, but for now we need to remember, we need to know that when this happens, the decaying element usually originates another element, and sometimes this product is also unstable. For instance, when uranium-238, which is one isotope of uranium, partially decays, when it initially decays, it produces thorium-234, which decays to protactinium-234, which decays to uranium-234. And after a lot of decaying steps, the lead-206 is going to be produced. But because lead-206 is stable, so this lead here is stable, it does not decay, so the decaying sequence will stop at this point here. Given that, there is no way to predict when a radioactive nuclide will have a nuclear decay. But if we have a collection of radioactive nuclides, we are able to predict that they will decay exponentially at a certain rate, characterized by a parameter known as the half-life. Half-life is the time required for exactly half of the nuclides to decay on average. This is the basics of radiometric dating. For instance, carbon has three naturally occurring isotopes. So we have carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. Carbon 12 and carbon 13 are stable isotopes. So these are stable isotopes of carbon. And carbon-12 represents 98.9 of all this carbon, and carbon-13 represents only 1.1%. Now, carbon-14 is not stable. Carbon-14 is unstable. It's radioactive. So carbon-14 is radioactive and it will decay to the stable isotope, nitrogen-14, and nitrogen-14 is stable. Now, carbon will decay, carbon-14 will decay to nitrogen-14, and carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,700 plus or less 40 years. But we approximate this to 5,730 years. And one important thing to notice is that because carbon-14 will decay to nitrogen-14, we will say that carbon-14 is the parent, 
So it's going to be the parent isotope. And nitrogen-14 is going to be the daughter atom. Okay, so now we know that carbon-14 will decay to nitrogen-14. And the half-life of carbon-14, which is represented by this notation here, is equal to approximately 5,730 years. This means that if we have a collection of carbon-14 radionuclides today, so let's say today is time zero, so if we have this collection, which is 100%, after one half-life or 5,730 years, half of them will have decayed to nitrogen-14 on average. So this means that after this one half-life will have half of the isotopes we had at the beginning. And then, after a second half-life, which will add up to 11,460 years, we will have only 25% of the isotopes, the radionuclides we had at the beginning. And this is because we'll have half of the 50% we had after one half-life. Now let's say we have another half-life, which will add up to 17,190 years. So now we have three half-lives after today. This means that we will have half of the nuclides that we had before. So we'll have half of the 25 we had before, which will be 12.5% of the total radionuclides we had at the beginning. One important thing to notice here is that, for instance, after one half-life, we have 50% of carbon-14 atoms remaining. And this means that 50% of the carbon-14 atoms have decayed to nitrogen-14. So we'll have 50% of carbon-14 and 50% of nitrogen-14. And this goes on. After two half-lives, we will have 25% of carbon-14 atoms, which means that 75% of the carbon-14 atoms will have decayed to nitrogen-14 atoms. So we'll have 75% of nitrogen-14 atoms. Now, which are the stable and which are the unstable isotopes? Is there a pattern that can help identify them? Well, we may observe an apparent pattern by plotting the isotopes in a diagram of the number of neutrons, n, so this is the number of neutrons, versus z, which is the number of protons, here in the x-axis. So here we may have noticed that the stable isotopes are these ones that are plotted here in black. So here, for the light elements, that is the ones with the Z number up to 20, the greatest stability occurs with a ratio of protons to neutrons that is close to 1. However, for the heavy, the heavier isotopes, the heavier elements, so with a Z higher than 20, this Z to N ratio gets closer to 1.5. So the isotopes, so the stable isotopes, will form this valley here of stability from hydrogen to uranium like we see here, all of those in black. So, for instance, the oxygen, which is located right here because it has Z equals to 8, so it has 8 protons. So, oxygen 
we'll have 11 isotopes that vary from oxygen 12 to oxygen 22. But only the median ones, the ones here in between them, which are the ones we already know, the oxygen 18, oxygen 17, and oxygen 18, only these are stable. And all of the others that are, all of these, except for these three, they are unstable, so they are radioactive, and they have a half-life that vary from 122 seconds to less than a femtosecond. Okay, so in this series of videos, we will focus our attention on the stable isotopes. So, we have to figure out, we have to know why do we care about the stable isotopes. The thing is, some of these stable isotopes that are naturally occurring and found in abundance in our environment are the principal elements of hydrological, geological, and biological cycles. And therefore, these are called environmental isotopes. These isotopes are hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. These are of practical importance for us because they serve as tracers of water, carbon, rocks, nutrient, and solute cycling. And this is it for today. Today we've talked about stable and unstable isotopes or radioactive isotopes. Thanks for watching. Please leave your comments below. And if you enjoyed your time at Geologia da Terra, please like and subscribe.